we'll come to the Lord uh, in prayer now. Uh, before we do, I'll, I'll mention uh, that we've had uh, news that um, uh, uh, Darren and Rachel, who many of you will know here, uh, uh, Rachel has given birth to a, a son, uh, Jude Caspian Gilchrist, born six pounds, 10 ounces. Uh, I believe it was a, a challenging uh, birth, so, um, but Rachel is, is recovering well from what I've heard. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll remember them in our prayers this evening as well. Uh, Let's come before the Lord. Uh, Heavenly Father, we do uh, thank you that we are able to come this evening and worship you. Uh, Lord, we uh, recognize what a privilege it is for us to meet one with another, uh, to be around your word, uh, to spend time uh, singing hymns of praise and worship, uh, to be able to come in corporate prayer before you and offer up intercessions. Uh, Lord God, we're able to um, spend some time looking at your word and and seeking uh, to to be taught uh, about who you are and what you have done uh, for your people. Uh, We pray, Lord God, as we we spend time worshipping you this evening, as we meet as a body of believers uh, here in St. Melons, uh, Lord, we just pray you will bless this time to us, uh, that it will be a time when we are able to, to reflect on the goodness of who you are, uh, the goodness of the God uh, of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, uh, that the very same God whom we read about uh, in the pages of Scripture uh, is the God who reigns eternally. And Lord, it is our uh, honor and our privilege to be able to come before you uh, and worship you. Uh, we, Lord God, we thank you that although you are a vast and a mighty God, uh, you are a God who has brought all things into creation. We thank you, Lord God, that you are a personal God, uh, that through your spirit uh, indwelling within us, uh, Lord, you uh, meet with us on an individual level. Uh, Through the work of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, you have provided uh, a means, uh, a path uh, to redemption. Lord, that you have given us um, uh, the certainty of hope that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that uh, all of these uh, great and wonderful truths about who you are and what you have done for us are not by accident. They're not a series of happy coincidences. They're not a story that ends up with a happy ending uh, out of fortune. But Lord God, they are uh, the very means by which you have elected to save your people. Uh, That from before the beginning of time, you have laid out a plan Uh, to restore to yourself your people. And so, Lord God, as we open up your word and as we we read of the the glories uh, that are found within there, we seek to apply them to our lives here in St. Melons today. Lord, we thank you uh, that they are the plans of a God who who knows all things, whose wisdom is beyond compare, uh, whose grace is sufficient, uh, whose mercy knows no end. Lord God, you are worthy of all praise. Lord, you are worthy of so much more praise than we could ever hope to offer. Lord God, we pray that you would instill within us a burning desire to give you the glory in every avenue of our lives. Uh, Lord, we pray as a church here, you would give us that burning desire to serve you to serve our King, not out of a sense of obligation, but out of love, to serve you because we love you. Lord God, we pray that you would lay that upon our hearts, that we might seek to see your kingdom growing in in this particular part of Cardiff that you have placed us. Lord God, we pray that you would draw our souls to this chapel. Our Lord, that they would hear your word being preached, uh, that they would be struck by the sincerity of of fellowship, uh, that they would be amazed that uh, the men and women of of different um, ages and different uh, interests and backgrounds uh, uh, love to meet together to worship you. That it wouldn't be the specialness of who we are that draws anybody in because, Lord, we know that we are not special. But, Lord, it would be the specialness of Jesus Christ, uh, the Savior who would draw in lost souls. Lord God, we pray that you would give us great wisdom and strength as we seek to witness to the the community around us, that we would uh, 
delight in, in working, Lord God, being workers for the gospel. We would delight in serving you as our king. Lord, that we would uh, see great purpose in working for the gospel's sake. Lord, we pray for opportunities uh, to, to, to witness to those around us. We thank you for this morning and the opportunity to have some of the Sunday school families coming to the, to the service. Uh, we pray for uh, the various outworkings of the church, whether with the uh, First Steps group and, and all of the uh, young parents coming in with their, their young children, uh, the ladies' work, young people's work. Lord, we pray that in every avenue, you would provide opportunities for your gospel to be proclaimed. And Lord, we pray for every single one of us, not just those who stand in the pulpit, not just the elders or the deacons, but every single one of us who confesses upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you would give us opportunity, wisdom, the words to say, and the lives to live that point to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, we would cry out, especially at this time, for a, for a pastor. Uh, Lord, it has been too long. And uh, Lord, we know that um, your timing is perfect. We know that your wisdom is perfect. Uh, but we would cry out that you would send a man soon uh, who will lead the flock, uh, delight in your word. Um, Lord, we just pray that there would be uh, somebody out there who, who you are right now stirring in their hearts. Perhaps they don't know uh, that St. Melons is where you would have them be, but Lord, we just pray that you would be working in such a man's heart. Uh, Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the congregation here and the, the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We think about those going through uh, trials of this, this present time, uh, through illness and infirmity. Lord, that you would be ever so close, and that perhaps in physical frailty there would be great spiritual strength. Uh, Lord, we think of some of those members who have gone to glory this year and the sadness that we felt with them in their physical condition and yet the encouragement that we have had as a body of believers here in their spiritual vigor. And Lord God, we know that uh, even in fragile bodies, you work uh, in, in incredible ways. And uh, Lord, we uh, think particularly at this time of, of those who've gone to university, uh, especially those that have gone for the first time. We think of Meg uh, in Cambridge. Lord God, we just pray you'd have your hand upon our young people, that in the days of their youth that they might stand firm on the gospel um, and that they might not shy away uh, in the face of a world that is increasingly oppressive, increasingly challenging. Lord, we pray for uh, strength in our young people. Uh, Lord, we think of Beth. Uh, we thank you uh, that Beth was with us this morning and uh, the joy it is to, to have her restored to us. We just pray for her continued recovery, physical strength at this time. I uh, pray for the family that you would give them uh, an encouragement to, Lord God, um, and that uh, we might have some good, uh, continuing good uh, news in the coming days. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the good news that we've, we've heard of, of uh, uh, the, the new Gilchrist baby. We pray for Rachel as she uh, recovers. Lord, that you would give her physical strength and that you'd be close to her. Uh, we thank you for the safe arrival of a, another child. We pray that, Lord, you would uh, continue to Strengthen uh, Darren and Rach to, to raise their children in the, the fear of who you are. And we pray for their continued work in, in Ramsbottom and uh, Darren's work in uh, the publishing industry. Lord, that you would uh, use them for your glory's sake. And uh, Lord, we thank you that uh, uh, once again, it is a reminder of, of, of your graciousness and your, your mercy and your kindness. Uh, we pray, Lord God, for our children. We pray that you would save them from their sins at an early age that you would draw them to you. We know that you delight in the presence of, of children. Uh, we pray, Lord God, that you would give parents the, the wisdom and the, the knowledge and the understanding to raise their children in a manner which uh, proclaims the gospel day to day. And uh, Lord, that um, you would continue to grow those, those families within our church uh, for your glory's sake. Uh, so Lord God, as we, as we worship you this evening, as we come before you, we know we, we're coming before a God who hears our prayers, a God who delights in the prayers of his people, and a God who uh, is, is wise and uh, uh, above, all, uh, above all else, Lord God, a, a God uh, who is in control, a God who is sovereign, a God who reigns. And so we come before you knowing uh, that you are exactly who you say you are. You are the great God of the Bible. You are the great God of Israel. You are the great God of your people. 
Uh, so we pray, Lord God, that you would bless us this evening as we seek to serve you uh, in the coming days. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we'll sing uh, a third hymn um, from the uh, Supplements book, and number 100. O Lord our God, how majestic is your name. The earth is filled with your glory. O Lord our God, you are robed in majesty. You've set your glory above the heavens. We'll stand to sing. Uh, let's just pray before we open up God's word. Heavenly Father, as we open up this passage from uh, Psalm 15, we pray that you would illuminate it to us, and we pray that we might have understanding of, of what your word is revealing, and that we might have the wisdom to apply it uh, to our own lives um, and seek to, to respond uh, in the coming days. We pray, Lord God, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, this evening, we're going to take some time to consider uh, Psalm 15, and it's a psalm which is uh, reminiscent and uh, sort of related uh, to both Psalm 1 and Psalm 24. They're on a, a similar uh, theme, and they're often referred to as the, um, the entrance uh, liturgies in, uh, in uh, particular traditions, but um, they open up uh, something of a profound 
um, question uh, that I want us to consider uh, this evening. Um, and it's a question of uh, what it means to, to lead a, a righteous life, what it means uh, to dwell in the presence of the Almighty God. Um, you may well have uh, that as a title in, in your version uh, of the Bible, who shall dwell on your holy hill, as we see in verse 1. Well, most uh, commentators and most theologians uh, tend to agree that uh, David wrote this psalm uh, at a particular uh, time, a time when he oversaw the return of the Ark of the Covenant to the holy hill of Zion. Um, he felt confronted by a great weight uh, in doing so, um, a great weight of the, the glory um, of this, uh, this task, uh, the very presence of, of God uh, in, in moving the Ark of the Covenant. And as a result, um, felt compelled to, to write this uh, psalm. Um, it's a psalm which, which, which really focuses on one simple question and then has a series of almost uh, bullet points uh, uh, to, to respond. The question is this, who shall dwell on the Lord's holy hill? Um, and David was contemplating the, the seriousness of, of, of this task or, or reflecting on the seriousness of this task, um, particularly thinking about uh, Israel's corporate response to worshipping uh, the God of Abraham uh, and of Isaac. Uh, the, the great responsibility there is in worshipping the living God. And it's not something that should be done flippantly, uh, but it's something that there is a great weight of seriousness uh, to it. And so we have this incredibly soul-searching question, who shall dwell on your holy hill? That's a question that we can then apply to ourselves here today as we consider these things. Uh, we consider uh, what it means um, to uh, approach uh, the living God. Um, David had a particular understanding, obviously he had a great weight of a burden upon him as, as king of Israel, and um, he knew what it meant uh, to, to lead the, the, the ark back uh, to Jerusalem. Um, he also understood something of the grave consequences of um, not doing so in an appropriate manner. Um, several decades before uh, this time, uh, as David writes, uh, the Philistines uh, who had captured the Ark of the Covenant uh, eventually returned it to the land of Israel. And we read of the uh, very challenging account of, of a number of Israelites gazing upon the Ark uh, in a manner which violated God's commands. And letting curios curiosity get the better of them, they, they treated the most holy of objects as if it was just a common object of interest. And we read in scripture the very uh, uh, sudden description of, the, of their doom. They, they, they died, they lost their lives. Um, we also then read of the, the response of those who, who, who watched the event, those who had survived. They said in 1 Samuel chapter 6, who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? So after those events and uh, uh, the, the ark being in somewhat of uh, a state of, of limbo, um, it was left in the home of an, a man named um, Abinadab. And uh, after a few, few more years of it being left there with Abinadab, um, it was decided that, uh, or David decided that two brothers, Uzar and Ahio, along with a number of other men, were, were responsible for transporting it back to uh, the city. And we read of them um, loading it on an ox cart be brought back to Jerusalem. And uh, the, the sad uh, um, events that occurred while in transit in taking the ark back to Jerusalem, the, the, the cart uh, toppled over, the, the oxen uh, uh, fell. And uh, Uzar reaching out, tried to grab the ark, trying to, to, to catch it or to, to, to steady it, um, to prevent it from hitting the ground. And that was a grave mistake for him. Uh, the Lord struck him dead in an instant. And as we read that passage and we read um, of, of that account, we might be tempted to think, well, well, why did that happen? Surely he was trying to do the right thing. Surely he was trying to, uh, in the midst of an unfortunate series of events, do the thing that he should do in preventing it from hitting the ground. Well, uh, R.C. Sproul, the, the American uh, preacher, explains it like this. I think it's really, really helpful. He says, in the first place, we might wonder why in the world the ark was being transported in an ox cart. It was to be transported on foot. 
There were loops at the edge of the throne through which uh, stays were inserted to make sure that no human hand ever touched the throne. But they were in a hurry and they put it on an ox cart. And as they're going down, Uzar did the unthinkable. He touched the throne of God. But we might say, well, hold on. Why did he do it? Um, or why was it a problem that he did it? His motive was pure. He was trying to preserve the throne of God from being desecrated by the mud. But the presumptuous sin of Uzar was this. He assumed that his hands were less polluted than the dirt. See, this was a, 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 an act of great importance. Such importance that even something seemingly innocuous is dealt with uh, very severely by the Lord. Uh, so David knows this. Uh, he knows the seriousness of bringing the ark back to Jerusalem. Um, he, is, he is full of trepidation. He even says in 2 Samuel chapter 6, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? He, he felt a great burden. And really, the reason why I thought it was important to outline those events is that they're a physical example of what we see David writing about here. It's the same principle that underlies this psalm. When we read in verse 1 of Psalm 15, O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? It's that feeling of, of great weight of responsibility, that these things ought not to be taken lightly, that there is a seriousness to the glory of God, a seriousness that is oftentimes uh, somewhat flippantly uh, uh, cast to the side. It's also important that as we seek to read these verses and we see David uh, uh, asking this question, who shall dwell on the holy, uh, your holy hill, we seek to apply it somewhat to ourselves uh, today because although David was writing in reflection of a, a literal event of the Ark of the Covenant being brought back uh, to Jerusalem, we can apply this uh, to ourselves today. We, we, we don't have the Ark uh, brought to us here in uh, St. Melons, um, but we, we might consider what it means to be a member of the church here, and the seriousness with which we hold such things. Um, because somebody might say, um, of, oftentimes uh, we, we have people applying for, for membership, and they might say, well, who, who's able to join the church here in St. Melons? Can anybody become a member? Uh, can anybody come and, and, and take communion and, and take the bread and the wine? Can anyone come to the church meetings and, and vote about the affairs of the church? Um, maybe not the last one, they might not be so interested in that. Um, but as a church, we, we are, of course, in the business of attracting new members. You know, we, we're seeking to grow the church here, uh, not because we uh, are purely, you know, counting numbers, but rather we're seeking to fulfill the Great Commission, aren't we? In our small part of, of Cardiff, in our community, we're seeking to proclaim the gospel. We want people to come in. We want people to hear the good news. We want people to be saved. We want people to profess uh, their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to see lost souls become Christians. Um, but in order to join this church here in St. Melons, prospective members need, need an understanding of what it is that we believe. If you're a member here today, at some point, uh, you've gone through that process. Uh, you've, you've spoken to one of the elders. You, you've asked, uh, you know, what's, what's the, the criteria or the, the process for, for membership? Uh, you've sat with some of the elders, um, you've given your, your testimony, and then you've been asked if you can uh, assent to the church's statement of faith. And if everyone who's a member here has uh, had that and looked at that and, and gone through that, um, a statement of faith, which is a summary of, of the uh, 1689 Baptist Confession. Um, and, and if you're a member here, you've gone through that and you've assented. Because this is not, uh, not any old club. Um, if I wanted to, I uh, don't know where I'd find the time, but if I wanted to, I could go and join uh, the local gym. And uh, the only remit for that would be if I can pay the subscription. They'll let me in, and I can join and be part of the, the gym club. Uh, the same if you were to join uh, the, the local, I don't know, scout group, or whatever it is you wanted to join. it will be very loose criteria. Uh, but as long as you satisfy that loose criteria, you'd be able to join in. Well, we're not a, a society, we're not a club, we're a, we're a local church. And so we, we stand uh, with our statement of faith. And in order to be a member of our church, in order to enter into fellowship uh, with us as a member, you need to be able to 
um, uh, claim certain truths. So we believe, essentially, pivotally, we believe in the living God. If you don't believe in the living God, you will not to be applying for membership of St. Melon's Baptist Church. We believe that the living God is not a God made out of wood or, 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 uh, or steel, but is the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God whom we, we read about in Scripture. That's a core belief. We believe that to be true. We believe that he, the, the living God is the Lord of all creation. Oh, we don't ascribe to any other uh, theory or idea. We believe that he created the universe and everything in it. We believe that he has sovereign power over all of creation, that he's not just a God who has created something and then stepped back. No, he, he reigns, he sustains. We also believe that he's a personal God. We believe, as members of this church, uh, that we've been made in his image, that we have a relationship with him, that he has spoken to us through his word, through the prophets, uh, through the apostles, through the letters, through the poetry, and especially through his son. We believe these things. We stand on these things. But we believe that uh, our God is a triune God, three persons, not three separate gods. Uh, we believe that our God has ordained from before time a path of redemption and reconciliation. We don't believe that the living God is a God of chaos and happy circumstances. We believe here in St. Melons that he is a God who has provided a path back to him. And we believe that that path is his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe that he was made man. We believe that. We stand on that. We believe that he made atonement for our sins as the lamb who was slain. We don't think that's a fairy tale. We don't think that's a lovely allegory. We don't think that that's something that you can learn a, a morality tale from. We believe that Jesus died for our sins and he rose again. We believe that that very redemption picture that we see time and again in the Old Testament through the law, we see the sacrificial animals. We, we don't believe that that's just, again, circumstance or coincidence. We believe that that is a pattern that God laid out so that he might provide for us the ultimate sacrifice in his son. And we believe in the gospel. We believe in the power of the gospel to break into the hearts of a world that would have nothing to do with these things. We believe these things. If you're a member here today, you have proclaimed that, you've given your testimony to that, um, and you have agreed with the statement of faith that we have as a church here. Because being a Christian is not just a title. It's not just a label that we apply to ourselves. It's not just a, a tick box on a census. It's not something that any, anybody here was born into. It's not something that you have as part of your national identity. It's not just a, a convenient label that you can apply when it suits and drop when you want nothing to do with the church. No. We believe that as Christians here in St. Melons, Christians throughout the world, churches as they meet in fellowships, they meet not because they are wonderful, glorious people, the best of the best, but we are the worst of the worst who have been saved by our Saviour. We believe that. But it's really important that as we <clears throat> consider those things, we consider all those statements, and perhaps we have uh, uh, the statement of faith uh, that we refer to maybe, perhaps we have copies of the Westminster 16H9 so we can delve in deeper, we have commentaries on it. It's really important that we remember that those are words. They're powerful words, they're powerful truths for us to stand on and believe, but there's another demand that we, we have to make as a church. There's another demand that we have to make for anybody who wants to be a member of St. Melons. It's not just to be able to stand and sign a confession of faith. It's that we might live out that faith. We might live out that profession. We might stand on it and really stand on it. That we might in our lives proclaim. And so in every believer, there should be marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. I often think when I'm thinking of these things, because we live in a world, don't we, where it's increasingly secular, it's increasingly rejecting uh, uh, the living God, rejecting Christianity, but it still in many ways clings to the old conformities of religion and the old uh, titles 
And I often think about these things. And there's a particular episode of the West Wing that, that has always uh, struck me with this. Um, in the West Wing, the, the president meets um, there's, a, there's a, 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 um, a bunch of illegal immigrants from China who have uh, been found somewhere in America. And, and they're claiming to be Christians escaping persecution. And the president, because of course this would happen, that the president would personally meet them, uh, meets with one of the individuals and, and talks with him. Um, he, says, he says to him, there are questions as to the veracity of your claim. The, so the leader replies, yes, sir. Well, how did you become a Christian? He replies, well, I began attending a house church with my wife in Fujian. Eventually, I was baptized. Well, how do you practice? Well, we share Bibles. We, we, we don't have enough. Uh, we sing hymns. We hear sermons. Uh, we recite the Lord's Prayer. We seek to be charitable. Who's the head of your church? Well, the head of our parish is an 84-year-old man named Wen Ling. Uh, he's been beaten and imprisoned many times. But the head of our church is Jesus Christ. Can you name me any of Jesus' disciples? You can't, that's okay. I, I can't remember the names of my own children. And he replies, what? Peter, Andrew, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, Thaddeus, Simon, Judas, and James. Mr. President, though, no. Christianity is not demonstrated through reciting facts. You're seeking evidence of our faith, a wholehearted acceptance of God's promise for a better world. For we hold that man is justified by faith alone. By faith alone. Now, this is a television program. It's dramatic. Of course it is. But the point is this, in order to be a real Christian, you have to love the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to live out a life that reflects that faith. You have to live out a life uh, that walks righteously, seeks to be upright in, in, in your life. Now, of course, as Christians, we fail at times. We go through times of great challenge. But as Christians, we should be marked out as those individuals who don't have a list of statements that we live by, as helpful as they are, and as much as we should get to grips with such a statement. But we should have lives that reflect such truths. We read a, a similar passage to Psalm 15 in Isaiah chapter 33. Isaiah <coughs> writes, He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, who despises the gain of oppression, who shakes his hand lest they hold a bribe, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from looking on evil, he will dwell on the heights. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. His bread will be given him. His water will be sure. Isaiah writes in a very similar way to David here in Psalm 15. Um, Isaiah is, is, is saying that how a Christian or how a believer ought to behave um, if they want to live with the Lord uh, forever. And that's the expectation of a holy life, a life which pursues God's kingdom. Not just a life which can say the right things at the right time, but a life which is actively in pursuit of God. That's what we read in Psalm 15. O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? Who is allowed to enter God's kingdom? Who would feel at home in the, the Jerusalem temple and its courts? Who would feel at home in, in the local church? What does God expect of those who say... I believe in the one true living God. I believe in the God of Abraham. Because that expectation is of vital importance. Being a Christian can never be simply claiming the name of follower of Christ. Because there are many who do so out of insincerity. There are many who do evil under the badge of Christian. So this is an important question for us to consider this evening, if you call yourself a Christian, if you seek to enter uh, the kingdom of God, if you strive to dwell on the holy hill, how are you to live? And if you're not a Christian here this evening, but clearly something is pulling at your heart, otherwise you, you wouldn't be here, well, what do you need to do to dwell on the holy hill of the Lord? Well, I have six brief um, uh, points from Psalm 15 to pull out. The first answer is this. So who can dwell on the holy hill? Verse 2. He who walks blamelessly. This is such a person who used to walk according to the course of the world, but now is walking with Jesus, walking on the narrow path, rejecting the broad road that leads to destruction. This is someone who has repented, who's turned around, who's heading in a different direction. And they're walking with integrity. They're doing what is morally right. They're living a holy and God-fearing life. They're seeking to walk with integrity. As someone who is 
uh, striving to reflect God's goodness. They're seeking to do that which is right, to live righteous lives, not just paying lip service, but actually in their lives applying it. They've repented. But what does repentance involve? It involves walking away from, from that which is um, deceitful, from that which is immoral. It's walking away from theft and drunkenness and violence and lying and all the ways that uh, sin creeps into our lives. In fact, it's more than that. It involves rejecting everything that the world holds up dear, everything the world holds up with esteem. Repentance also involves recognizing the impact of our sin on those around us and recognizing that the pain that we've caused to others. It's walking away totally from our former lives, a life of sin, a life of self-satisfaction. It means walking with Jesus. Going back to him time and again when when you stumble. Putting your hand in the air and seeking to take his, the the very hand that that, that stilled the waters and calmed the seas. It means relying wholly on Jesus and not on ourselves. The verse verse carries on, uh, who shall dwell in your holy hill? Well, he who walks blamelessly and does what is right. Does what is right. Well, how did David know what was right? What was the right thing to do? We live in a world that has a very subjective view of right. David tells us uh, that those who dwell in the holy hill um, does what is right. And he knew full well what that meant. Because he had the law. We had the law. We had those set of instructions for righteousness, for, for living a righteous life. And David knew that very well. Those first four commandments which tell us of what it means to uh, obey God. First of all, God alone has a right to our worship. There are no other gods before him. Second, he will stand for no idols and we must not worship them. Third, his name is precious and should not be taken lightly or misused. Fourth, he has set apart his day as special. and We are to honor it. Well, God's word tells us that God commands that we, we, we receive these things And we honor these things. We do what is right. We obey his law. Because if we ignore them, we bear the consequences. The second, what we call table of the law, uh, commandments 5 to 10 of of the Ten Commandments, point us towards how we ought to live right towards other people. Um, The fifth commandment, to honor our parents with obedience. Sixth, to, to honor the sanctity of life. Seventh, to be faithful and, and, and honoring in our marriage. Eighth, to, to honor the property of others. Ninth, to hold up truth. Tenth, to not allow our hearts to desire those things around us. You see, God's law tells us how we ought to live rightly. It tells us how we can live in righteousness. They tell us what rights those around us have, our neighbors have. They tell us our obligations towards one another. So that's what David means in order to be blameless, to live a life of integrity, a life of repentance, to do what is right, to honor his law. Who shall dwell on the Lord's hill? The blameless and the righteous shall. Secondly, who shall dwell on your holy hill? Well, a truth teller, verse 2. Verse 2 carries on. Um, Does what is right and speaks truth in his heart. We know that very often... Uh, Our words give away our hearts. Um, We know that words can be very powerful. Uh, They can can be uh, very hurtful at times. Um, And we know the old adage that by our lips we are are condemned because our lips reveal sometimes our our hearts. What David is saying to us here is that uh, those who seek to dwell on on the Lord's holy hill cannot be careless about the truth. Cannot be careless about the words that we use and the things that we say. Now, we live in something of a post-truth age uh, these days, if if such a thing exists. But it's an age when truth itself is under attack. Um, Truth itself is is something of debate. That there's no such thing as right and wrong, the world would have us believe. Politicians use wordplay to weasel out of the things that we see in front of us. But it's crucial for our 
eternal future and for the future of the people we know and love, that truth is upheld, that we value truth. You can't be saved without truth, and you can't help others without truth. David says that one mark of speaking the truth from the heart is that such a a person, verse 3, does not slander with his tongue. And we have uh, some stark examples of that in the Gospels, don't we? Of the Pharisees slandering Jesus at every turn. Um, and every manner, whenever Jesus performed miracles or taught with great wisdom, they would quietly eat away at the side, saying, well, he's, his power is, is from the devil. It's, it's, not a, it's not from God. You see, they sought to undermine his authority. They sought to erode uh, the confidence of those growing crowds of people who were, who were amazed. And we know that that's, that's often the case, where, where words are, are eating away at truth. Um, very often that, that dark message of slander eats away at a person's character uh, from the sidelines. It's very much something that the world recognizes. That's why in every s- sort of massive uh, uh, Hollywood film, that's, that's one of the themes, isn't it? It's the slow voice of slander from uh, Senator Palpatine that corrupts um, Anakin Skywalker and turns him into Darth Vader for the Star Wars fans over at the back. Um, it's the steady drip of lies from the White Witch that turns Edmund in, in, in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It's the mutterings from Grima Wormtongue in, in Lord of the Rings that deceive the king. The world recognizes this. It's the quiet slander that ekes away, it corrupts the whole person. We know in James, uh, d- describes the tongue as being a restless evil full of deadly poison. Well, he who would dwell on God's holy hill must be a teller of truth, must reject slander. Well, thirdly, such a person is one who does his neighbor no wrong. We we continue in verse 3. Does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. Again, a mark of righteous living, living a right life, uh, is the way in which we treat our neighbors. We treat those around us. Um, How, though, can we be careful uh, to do our neighbours no wrong? How can we be supported in this, in in seeking to to not do evil to our neighbours? There's a a, a well-known American uh, podcaster, and he does all sorts of things, by by the name of Joe Rogan. And in one of his uh, recent uh, podcasts, he went off on a bit of a long, meandering thought uh, process, as he often does, where he sort of... Uh, theorized, well, he was talking primarily about fitness. He said, well, wouldn't it be great if there was just some kind of um, sort of textbook out there that just sort of told you humanity how to live? And he sort of carried on this, this chain of thought from initially, you know, the physical, you know, and, and then morality as well. Wouldn't it be incredible if there was just some kind of textbook or some guide that, uh, that pointed people how to, to make the right choices and to, to, to be sincere, and then we wouldn't have all this argument in the world? And uh, you sort of listen there thinking, good news, Joe, there is, there is, there is a textbook, there is a manual called the Bible. It it tells you how we ought to live. It tells us how we can not treat our neighbours in the manner that the world is doing. You see, God has given us his word. He's revealed it to us. It's there where he tells us how we might love him and how we might love one another, how we might seek to Uh, do them no wrong. And again, how do we know what is good? Well, we know from his word. We know from the law. We know that um, it is right that we we treat our neighbours with love and kindness. Now, David goes even a little bit further because he says, not only uh, uh, does such a person do no evil to his neighbour, but nor takes up a reproach against his friend. Because it's very easy, uh, similar to uh, thinking about uh, those uh, 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 lies and those, um, those ac- the, the slander with the tongue, it's very easy for, for some people to cast aspersions like a grenade, just sort of throw comments uh, without thinking of the consequences. You see, Jesus knew something of that in his own life as well. When he claimed that he would destroy the, the temple and raise it again in three days, those around him were full of slander. They called him crazy. They said, well, how can you trust such a man if he says such a ridiculous thing? Surely that erodes everything else he's ever said. 
And then they, they even looked and they said, well, how can this man be taken at his word? Look who he hangs around with. He hangs around with drunkards and tax collectors. They cast aspersions on him. They sought to demean him. They said he's not worth listening to. Look at who he hangs around with. He's not worth listening to. He's impre unimpressive. He's just, you know he's the son of a carpenter from Nazareth. He's not worth listening to. He's, he's different to us. It's very easy to cast a slur on someone who is saying something that contradicts you. But love doesn't do that. Love doesn't seek to break down people. It doesn't seek to uh, seek and destroy. Those who seek to dwell on God's holy hill must watch their tongues. And in doing so, they can become a people who do, their e do no evil to their neighbors, nor take up a reproach against their friends. Well, fourthly, uh, who shall dwell on your holy hill? Well, one who despises vile persons. We read verse 4. In whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord. <coughs> and this begs the question for us, doesn't it? Well, who is it that we honor? And who is it that we ought to revile? It's interesting looking at the world around us. Who does the world honor? In 2002... Uh, the BBC conducted a, a national poll to find out the 100 greatest Britons. Uh, we had uh, various um, people there. We had John Lennon at number eight, William Shakespeare at number five, and Winston Churchill at number one. Um, these are men and women that the country, the nation, uh, reveres, honours. There are statues to all of those men and women in the, uh, the, the, that 100 Great Britons list. Um, perhaps if we updated the list today, well, who would, who would find themselves heading up that leaderboard? Maybe Queen Elizabeth II, perhaps, uh, who wasn't on there. Uh, perhaps someone like David Beckham, who seems to be uh, still uh, the sweetheart of the nation. Maybe somebody like Mo Farah, who won all those gold medals and people would honour him uh, with such a way. But it's such a list of the greatest Britons that have, have ever lived. Where's John Bunyan? Man spent 12 years in prison. Um, because of the gospel, seeking to proclaim the gospel. He wrote one of the greatest works in literary history. Where's Robert Murray McShane? He accomplished more in his 30 years in life than perhaps <coughs> any other believer in such a short period of time. Where's John Owen or Daniel Rowlands? Where's George Whitfield in this list? Where's George Mueller? The man who cared for over 10,000 orphans in his lifetime. Established over 100 schools to meet their needs. Well, those men feared God and served him in such a manner that perhaps our uh, uh, service of the Lord, our fear of the Lord, seems like a flickering candle in comparison to their burning bonfires. But it's interesting that the world doesn't seek to honour them in any way. We ought to be very careful about who we honour and even some of those <clears throat> great individuals uh, that I've just mentioned. We, we need to guard our hearts from raising up idols amongst ourselves. Of course we do. But it's right that, that those who fear the Lord and live lives of, of service and gospel sincerity, uh, that we honor them greatly. And why is that important? Well, because the Lord does. There are brothers and sisters who have departed our own congregation in recent years. It's right that we have remembered them as, as good and faithful servants. Yet who we honour, uh, sorry, yet we who honour them must also, verse 4, despise the vile man. What strong words for us to use there, despise, vile. Those are not light words, are they? And sometimes when we read words like that in Scripture, it takes us aback a little bit to think, well, it's strange to see Scripture using words like that. We are um, commanded to, 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 to despise a vile person. But again, let's use the the life of the Lord Jesus Christ is a reflection of that. Remember, he referred to the, the king of Israel at, at that time as being that fox Herod. He was a cruel man. The man who uh, had John the Baptist beheaded just to please a dancing girl. He was a vile man. Those Pharisees who, who condemned Jesus and scorned him and cast aspersions and, and, and ate away at his ministry... Do, and yet at the same time as, as doing that, neglected the poor, neglected the needy. Well, he called them a brood of vipers. What vile men they were. 
And so it's right that we should despise those whose conduct is vile and evil <coughs> in the Lord's sight. He who may dwell on God's holy hill must un- honor those who fear God and despise those who, who are vile. A fifth coming to the end of it. Who shall dwell on God's holy hill? Well, one who keeps his promises, even when it hurts. You see, David is referring here to, to true uh, promises, a true oath, a solemn public promise. Um, it's possible to make promises with, even with its sincerity and for them not to be oaths. Um, it wouldn't be an oath for me to swear <coughs> that one day I was going to win an Olympic gold medal. I could very sincerely believe that. Um, but let's face it, that window is closed. It's not going to happen. Um, an oath is a weighty matter. An oath is a marriage oath made in front of uh, a congregation, uh, a promise in the presence of witnesses and before the living God. And so someone who makes an oath is under obligation to keep such oaths, to be dependable, to be somebody whose word is their bond, and to, to keep any promises that they make, even when it hurts, even when the consequences of those promises uh, bring hurt. You see, that's the point that David is making here. If it means the loss of blood, you'll do it. If it means a financial cost, you'll keep that oath. If it means turning 180 on your own personal hopes and dreams, you'll do it. Because he who may dwell on God's holy hill keeps his promises. And sixthly and finally, who may dwell on the holy hill? Well, one who does not put money, put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. Well, we know that in the Old Testament, in, in, in the law, it was forbidden to lend with interest um, to a fellow believer, uh, but such, a lend, uh, such an interest could be lent to, to the foreigner. Well, as the Bible, with, with its history of redemption, uh, unfolds and develops, um, we, we know that that doesn't mean that uh, you know, investments are, are condemned or you know, interest rates are, 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 are to be avoided. Um, what is condemned is greed, the love of money. Um, and also the, the subtext, charging extortionate um, interest rates to exploit other people, preying on the vulnerable and the needy. Those who dwell on God's holy hill must be generous and see their finances for what they are, which is not their own, but of the Lord's. And similarly, those who dwell on God's holy hill must uh, uphold the truth and condemn those who would seek to persecute the innocent. Um, we know that there are many nations around the world where um, corruption and bribery are, are ever-present throughout society. Uh, sadly, even though laws and practices are against it in the UK today, it would take a very naive person not to, to look at our own nation and know that there is bribery, there is deceit, there's corruption. Um, and that's not just on a, on a global scale. It's not just in a political scale. You know, it can be on a very personal level. Being offered a bonus at work that you know you don't deserve, but comes with some kind of wink and a, a nudge. Uh, a promotion that you know should go to somebody else. Seeing someone who, who ought not to take the fall, take the fall because of the actions of somebody else. Well, the point of, uh, of this final um, uh, command from David is that those who wish to dwell on God's holy hill must be people of great character. Those who place their trust in the living God, even when the situations and the circumstances might be challenging. We must be a Daniel in the lion's den. We must be the three friends in the, in the fire in Babylon. We must be John the Baptist in the throne room of Herod. Because he who does all these things, we read at the end of, verse, uh, uh, we read at the end of Psalm 15, he who does these things shall never be moved. So if you would delight to dwell on God's holy hill, we have a, a criteria. We have a list set out before us. Let's finish this evening by asking the ultimate question at the heart of this psalm, which is this. Do you want to dwell with the Lord? Because the Lord doesn't exclusively dwell here in, in Kasalim. Uh, if you're searching for the ark here this evening and you're, you're looking around, you're, you're going to be sorely disappointed. This building is just bricks and mortar. Uh, it's a lovely building and lots of work by a great many people have got into keeping it uh, the way it is, but it's just a building. If you want to dwell with the Lord, you must come to his throne. You must be blameless. You must be truthful. You must love your neighbor. 
You must honour the righteous and despise the vile. You must keep your promises. You must be honourable with your finances. Here's the rub of the green. Here's the twist in the tale. If you carefully have read David's psalm, if you've listened attentively uh, this evening to the sermon, if you feel like, well, now you have an achievable checklist that you can just tick off one after the other to accomplish, the reality of the gospel is this. You can't just take those six messages and tick them off. It's not a checklist. Because just like at the beginning uh, this evening, as we thought about the limitations of a statement of faith uh, in our church against the reality of living out a life for Christ, we have the same problem. You can try to be blameless and live a righteous life, and you should, but sin finds a way to creep in. You can try and be truthful, and and you should, but deceit is like an ever-present shadow. You can try to love your neighbor, but sometimes the love only goes so far. You can try and honor the righteous, but the world is constantly raising up its own heroes and changing the, the worldly view of morality. You can try and keep your promises, but we all know in our hearts that eventually promises fade. You can try and be honorable with your finances. Greed has many cloaks and comes in many ways. So is everything just meaningless? Is everything meaningless? Is seeking to dwell with the Lord just like swimming against the tide? That all these things we're, we're unable to achieve? Is David in this psalm just laying out the impossible task and watching us fail? Well, if we only trust in ourselves, the answer is yes, because we do fail. We are weak. But David knew what it was like to fail. He knew what weakness was like. But the same man who wrote Psalm 15 also wrote a number of the Psalms, including Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and at the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. You see, God hasn't left us with an impossible task to finish. He's left us with his son. He's left us with the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is blameless, the one who is righteous, the one who speaks truth, the one who knows what love is, the one who honors the lowly, uh, the lowly and the righteous, the one who keeps his promises, the one who defends the needy and the vulnerable. And the father sent the son so that he could accomplish all of these things. And so that his cloak of righteousness, not yours, not mine, his cloak of righteousness could be ours. So who can dwell on the holy hill? Who can dwell in Zion? The king can. And he has called his people to himself. He has paid the price for our sin. He has justified us. He has redeemed us. And he is calling Do you? Will you follow him? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would apply these verses to our hearts. We would delight, Lord God, to follow uh, these verses. Lord, we would, Lord, in our hearts, strive to be blameless, to be righteous, to be lovers of the truth, haters of evil. Lord, give us the strength uh, to accomplish these things. But Lord, give us the knowledge to know that it is not our own strength but is the Lord's. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for everything that he has accomplished. Thank you that he is our king. He is the king of all kings. And every king on earth, every ruler, every prime minister and president will one day fall and fail. 
for his throne is secure. Lord God, we would come before him in adoration. We pray that you would help us to lift our heads to the cross, to our King. In his name, amen. We'll finish our <clears throat> service this evening uh, by singing number 720. Who is on the Lord's side? Who will serve the King? Who will be his helpers? Other lives to bring. Who will leave the world's side? Who will face the foe? Who is on the Lord's side? Before him will go. By thy call of mercy, by thy grace divine, we are on the Lord's side. Saviour, we are thine. Let's stand to sing.
The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. Amen. <laughs> 